I think so. I think we're going to wake up after the um, Thursday election night with a Conservative government. That's just the way things are. We have a Tweedledee, Tweedledum set up here. Um, but Labour will be so discredited, then they are really, I think they're going to struggle for their survival. They're not, they're not raising the kind of money that they have done. There's all kinds of internal problems with them. And the Tories will inherit a bankrupt, um, financially failed state, in effect. And once... Who are the Tories? The Conservatives, sorry. Okay, yep. Well, do, the, the, the nickname is the Tories. D- does the British National Party have a specific strategy to extend into the middle-class strongholds of the, of the Conservatives or, t- or Tories? Or is that possible for now? I think with the perilous state of our economy there's a very real chance of the middle class is actually dissolving and ceasing to become middle class and being the new working class as opposed to working class becoming underclass. Um, I think if things do go wrong financially, and I hope it doesn't happen, even though it would be politically advantageous for us, I think if things really do go wrong with the level of debt that we've got now and the fact that we simply don't have uh, one, the kind of captive economy to, to make things better because money just is so porous now with internationalism it flows out of the borders. We don't have the capacity to make things anymore. Um, it's, it's a very perilous state. And I think if the Tories aren't careful, they could find in two years' time with the honeymoon well and truly over um, themselves with a, with a very, very large problem indeed. If one day Mr. Nick Griffin walked through the door of Number 10 Downing Street as Prime Minister and Simon Darby was waiting at home for that magic telephone call, what ministerial job would you like to be given? Now, that is a question. That is a question. Um, One of the most powerful jobs, of course, are the the Home Secretary and the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm... I'm into, into my wildlife. Minister the, for the Environment would be very satisfying um, for me because I, I, would, I would make a difference. It, it, it upsets me, for instance, where natural habitats of some of our birds and animals are just um, bulldozed over to make room for more Labour voters. Um, I, I just put a stop to that. And um, I get a great deal of satisfaction out of doing that. I, there, there are so many things that need put in right here. And the fact that our we're coming up to a winter now, and a lot of our pensioners just freeze to death because they can't afford to keep warm. Thousands of our pensioners die of hypothermia, and yet we still send billions of pounds of foreign aid to countries that are basically corrupt. We're just, we're just propping up their, their leaders. And I'd love to be the chap that said to India, for instance, who take six or seven hundred million pounds a year um, in, in, in foreign aid, even though they can develop their own space program, and we can't. I'd love to say, no, you're not having that check anymore. It's going to our old folk. Um, that would be a very satisfying thing to do. You know, y'all's problems sound identical to our problems here in the States. Uh, I, it's just amazing to hear you talk about it. But we don't have any party. Um, and we don't have anybody of your sort of stature who can speak eloquently to all these issues. Anybody who, who's talking, they're perceived as bad people. You know, there's nobody, there's no one wholesome who's just, who could attract people because anytime you go toward this, anything associated with racial, there's always a criminal, sinister um, put on you. And it's, it's constant, it's pervasive, and it's mainly done by the media here in the States and I assume over there as well. It's, it's incredible how they, this political correctness has dominates wouldn't you don't you think it is i mean racism is the new witchcraft isn't it it's if you look at some of the the witch trials we've had here and the salem witch trials and whatever you see the psychological um similarities are startling quite mm-hmm. startling. We, we, it's no it's no different than people shouting heretic and witch and um that's good I just look forward to the day that, that, I, I like that, that, it, that that's good I, w- w- yeah i'm gonna use that witchcraft yeah yeah, well, we're the new witches. That's what we are, yeah. and um, it's 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 catering to a kind of a mob rule where people do need they're intimidated to kind of comply and uh, stigmatize should they deviate from the acceptable parameters. But I look forward to the day when um, people don't dare 
to shout down. They wouldn't dare to shout down our natural um, justice for our peoples, uh, plural, that is, peoples. I hope that happens in America as well, where this whole system is just shown up and the people behind it are found out of what they've been done and the, um, they have a taste of their own medicine, so to speak, because I, uh, what they're doing is very wicked, very wicked indeed. I saw where Mr. Griffin went to Cambridge University. Is that right? He did. He studied law at Cambridge, yes. Is, is that a, on a par with Oxford University? I mean, is that one of the, the elitist universities in the world? Yeah, there's, there's with two. Um, we have some very good universities in this country, but Oxford and Cambridge are the Best. the most not, no, most notable. He won a a boxing blue there as well for um, he was a very good boxer, and uh, he really looks he looks like a boxer. He looks like a good tough guy. Um, well, he, he wouldn't thank you for saying that. <laughs> oh no, no, I mean that in a good way. I mean most of most of our politicians are kind of wimpy guys. They they they're real frail men. They don't. They don't have a ruggedness about him, um, but he looks like a he looks like a good just a good man. I just wonder how is he going to become his his style and tone in in dealing with all these opponents out there. Is he going to try to uh, be friendlier, or is he going to try to become more aggressive? What what kind of style is he evolving, or is he static? He's not an aggressive chap. Um, if you know Nick, he's got every reason to be aggressive for what's been done to him in the past. But he's a very, I've never known him lose his temper. Um, unlike me, I occasionally lose my temper. Um, but Nick never loses his temper. He's very, very well thought of in the party. He's seen as, as, a, as a friend rather than as a chairman. He'll, he'll, he'll take the time to talk to people. I go mad at him because he spends all his time talking to members rather than doing media interviews and things like that. He, he, he's a... He really is a, a people's person. Um, he doesn't. He has no airs and graces about him at all. And uh, I've known him for a long time, and um, I've seen him with um, political opponents, interviewers, and whatever. And no one's ever got the better of him. Well, no you, one's ever got the better of him. That that he is. He's becoming really fascinating to me. But you know, in the states, anyone I can't think of anybody who had a Cambridge background. Somebody you know, like of that stature who, who stood up and did what y'all are doing over there. But the people who have attempted, and there have been only a tiny, you can count them on one hand, who've done that, they, they weren't, they had some moral problems personally and some shady stuff. There, there's the good, in other words, the good people don't go public. They're anonymous. It's almost like they're hiding in the bushes, scared to even talk. Even though, you know, ir- ironically, we have freedoms here in America, I think, that y'all don't have over there, that, for the time being anyway. We have the First Amendment that guarantees our right to free speech. But, you know, there are limitations on that. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater, and you can't threaten someone. But in terms of other things, I mean, we, I think, enjoy a lot more freedom of speech than y'all do, but yet people are silent. They're quiet as mice. You, you make some good points there, and have you ever thought, for instance, when you say that the good people are in the uh, in the background, they don't say anything, and the, the people that do say things are, are the bad people in the eyes of the public um, and the media? But have you ever considered that when there's a process where you actually say the wrong thing, you're immediately demonised, and all of these things are uh, instantly kind of brought out, uh, fabricated, and uh, manipulated? I, I think I know who you're referring to in, in the states. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I've met David David Duke. Are you referring to David Duke? Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, very intelligent man. Um, a very intelligent man, but somebody who um, has had his problems with the media. Is it by coincidence? Uh, I don't think it is. I think you'd find that anybody with respect to David, um, anybody in his position saying the kind of things that he, he does, he's, he's going to be demonized. He's going to be demonized. There's no two ways about it. But you do have those people there. You do have those um, people who are every bit as clever as us over here. Believe me, there are, I've met some very intelligent Americans, some very wealthy Americans who are very concerned with what's going on. But you need to start at a grassroots level. What happens in America, you have talking rooms and you all talk. The nationalist movement talks and you have congr- uh, conferences and whatever, but nothing happens.